Well, do I have a dirty story for you today? Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirkpatrick. I am an author, editor, and robot. And before we get started, I just want to let you know if you are interested in reading a story of mine. I have been accepted into the FWA's 2020 collection with the theme Illusions. I'm going to leave a link down in the description below if you would like to buy your own copy. I don't get anything from it, but you get the satisfaction of reading a collection of like 60 or more short stories with the theme of illusion. So if you're interested, find it down below. Otherwise, let's just get into this mess. New York Times recently posted, a feud in wolf kink erotica raises a deep legal question. What do copyright and authorship mean in the crowdsourced realm known as the Omegaverse? So I'm not in the erotica realm. I'm not even part of the romance industry realm. I don't write in either of those genres. So what this, and I'm not in fan fiction either. So I don't know what necessarily Omega verse means, but according to this article, Omega verse stories typically feature characters arranged into a wolf pack like hierarchy of dominant alphas, neutral betas, and submissive omegas, plus lots of lupine sex. On May 23rd, 2020, New York Times writes, Addison Kane was living in Kyoto, volunteering at a shrine and studying indigenous Japanese religion. She was supposed to be working on a scholarly book about her research, but started writing intensely erotic Batman fanfiction instead. It happened almost by accident. It was 2012, and Miss Kane, who grew up in Orange County, California, under a different name, was three years out of college, alone abroad with a lot of time on her hands. Her command of Japanese was halting, and English titles in bookstores were wildly expensive. So Miss Kane started reading things she could find for free online and soon discovered fan fiction. It's pretty difficult to avoid um, online. Stories by amateurs that borrow characters and plots from established pop culture franchises. And it doesn't have to just be franchises. Uh, if you look at, at places like Wattpad.com, uh, you'll see lots of band fan fictions or musician fan fictions as well. A couple of years ago, it used to be overrun with One Direction fan fictions. Now the One Direction fan fictions have kind of toned back a little bit, and they're not just contained to the fan fiction subgenre on the website. They're in everything. Drama, fan fiction. Romance, fan fiction. Historical fan fiction. Don't ask me how. <laughs> but now it's now that the One Direction and and Harry Styles fan fictions are toned back. You'll still find them, but it's more or less overrun with K-pop right now and uh, other people, but mostly K-pop. It's like seven K-pop, one original. Well, six K-pop, two One Direction, and an original, and somebody else. Anyway. Miss Kane began devouring works set in the world of Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. She decided to write some of her own, featuring Batman's nemesis Bane as a sexy anti-hero, and posted them for free online. She quickly developed a fan base, becoming something of a star in her sub-sub-genre. A few years later, she was living in Arlington, Virginia, and working as a bartender when she began to wonder if she could turn her hobby into a business. This is where you start getting in trouble because you've used somebody else's IP, intellectual property, to build a base. And now you're like, how can I make money off of somebody else's IP? That is a legal issue. Her husband and parents discouraged her from pursuing something so impractical. Agents were equally dismissive, rejecting and ignoring Miss Kane's queries for more than a year. Then a fellow writer helped Miss Kane send a manuscript to Blushing Books, a small publishing house in Charlottesville. An editor read it overnight and sent her a contract the next day. So don't ever anybody tell me that the world does not run on nepotism. It's always, almost always, 90% of the time, it's somebody who knows somebody know, who knows somebody hands hands them something for you and that's how you get anywhere in life uh that is the point of placement agencies it's it's to give you somebody who knows somebody to get you in the door uh so everything is run on nepotism don't at me that this person is corrupt because of nepotism everybody does it in the spring of 2016, she published Born to be Bound, an adaptation of her fan fiction. The story takes place on a future Earth where most of humanity has died from the plague and survivors live in an under live under a dome divided into a wolf pack like hierarchy of dominant alphas, neutral betas, and submissive omegas. A powerful, brutish alpha named Shepard takes an omega woman named Claire captive and they engage in rough, wolfish sex. I told you it was going to be hot. Mrs. Kane's fans posted nearly 100 positive reviews on Amazon. 
soaking wet probably, enough to get her some visibility. Quote, unapologetically raw and deliciously filthy, read one glowing blurb. The debut was a hit. She rushed out several more titles, and the series grossed more than $370,000, according to a publisher. Apparently, this is how I should get in. I should just fanfic, turn it into a wolf verse, and then retitle it. I need to be doing this to make money, you guys. For the, mo for the next two years, Miss Kane published at bottleneck speed, producing a novel every few months by repurposing her older fan fiction, keeping her books in the algorithmic sweet spot of Amazon's new releases, and turning herself into a recognizable brand. Dip your toes into the erotic pool, she said on a 2016 sci-fi fantasy podcast. There's nothing to do here but make money. So uh, let's get started by saying I think you're smarmy, Addison Kane. Uh, first, you build your name by using somebody else's characters, which I consider fraud. Right, so you took somebody else's IP, somebody else's universe, and and put your story in it, which likely had your char the characters completely out of character. It was whatever you wanted to do them in. Yeah, like if we're talking about Batman turned into werewolves, there's no way that they're in character. So you you used somebody else's IP to gain their fans to build your backing, so that you could strictly make money. It's not about storytelling. It's not about something unique. It's not about telling a point of view. It's just to make money from thirsty, lonely women who have married soy men who cannot push them up against the wall and give them the good sex they want. That is what you have done or is being implied here. This is opinion. I think you're smarmy for this. But I think it gets worse, actually. Then in 2018, Miss Kane heard about an up-and-coming fantasy writer with the pen name Zoe Ellis, who had published an erotic fantasy series with a premise that sounded awfully familiar. It featured an alpha and omega couple and lots of lupine sex. The more Miss Kane learned about Myth of Omega and its first installment, Crave to Conquer, the more outraged she became. In both books, alpha men are overpowered by the scent of Omega heroines and take them hostage. That totally original idea on Miss Kane's part. In both books, the women try and fail to suppress their pheromones and give in to the urge to mate, also totally original to Miss Kane. In both books, the couples sniff, purr, and growl. That is the most, probably the most unique original idea I have ever heard in my life. I almost can't even, but cannot believe that a wolf might purr and growl and sniff. Like, what universe does Miss Kane live in? I can believe in the Batman. I can believe that Mormons get a planet of their own when they die because of being Mormons, but I cannot believe that wolves would actually sniff and growl. Like, that is so far out of the realm of possibilities. No. Uh, she also had nest in den-like enclosures. Look, I have been to enough zoos, and also to a wildlife sanctuary in Tennessee that was mostly wolves. I have seen how they live. Three-story flats with 72-inch televisions, HD televisions, mind you, hooked up with all of the channels, all the premium channels, and the internet straight into the TV. Smart kitchens. They have the works. I would, I would actually argue that den-like enclosures is less believable than sniff and growling wolves. Let me know what you think, though. Have you, what, what kind of living situations have you seen wolves living in? Uh, neck bites to leave claim marks because that is totally also original and so out of it's so easy to accidentally steal that because it's so unique to Miss Kane. Nobody has ever left a hickey on anybody else. Nobody like Nexium has ever left a mark on their followers to show ownership of them. Neck biting to leave a claim mark. How does this woman come up with this stuff? I just, I don't know. And experience something called nodding involving a peculiar feature of the wolf phallus. Wow. So you're telling me before 2016, when Miss Kane published her book for the first time, after it was fan fiction, mind you, that the idea behind the biological difference of a wolf's cock didn't exist? She's, she came up with nodding. There is not one instance of nodding anywhere mentioned on the internet before 2016 when her story came out. This, I didn't, I didn't know that authors could own biological fact. Dude, I need to get on copywriting the, cur the curly dick of a pig and the, the detachable dick of an octopus. And I certainly need to get on top of copywriting Sharks having two dicks. Just in case I decide I want to use it in the future, I need to own the idea of biological fact.
I should honestly, I should just go copyright the fact that men have dicks before anybody else does. Just in case I ever want to do a story where a man has a dick. I need to stake my claim into that specific thing so nobody else can use it. Because it's so original, man. Sorry, God. I came up with that idea. Miss Kane urged Blushing Books to do something. The publisher sent copyright violation notices to more than half a dozen online retailers, alleging that Miss Ellis' story was a copy with scenes that were almost identical to Addison Kane's book. Most of the outlets, including Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and Apple, removed Mrs. El Miss Ellis' works immediately. Miss Kane's readers flocked to her defense. This is a ripoff of Addison Kane, one irate reader wrote on Goodreads. So disappointed in this author, and I hope Miss Kane seeks legal charges against you for stealing her work. Shame on you. So this reads a lot to me like the situation with Courtney Milan where you cultivate an online following because they're super easy to get emotional uh, you build a passionate following and then you use them to take down your opponents or people who are kind of writing the similar thing as you or people who just you don't like for whatever reason maybe they're in your genre maybe you just don't like their ideas maybe you don't like who they voted for and you use your following to attack those people and get them taken down What's extra smarmy about this is uh, Miss, she was alleging that Mrs. Ellis, Miss Ellis was copying scenes from her book. Meanwhile, let's not forget that Addison Kane got her start in fan fiction. So she's taking down other people for copying her ideas of necking uh, hickeys, growling wolves, and um, pheromones. Oh, and wolf dick. Let's not forget that. The biology of wolf dick she's getting mad at people for but her whole start was copying other people's characters and universes to build an audience can you get any nastier than this it's hard to imagine that two writers could independently create such bizarrely specific fantasy scenarios it's really not that bizarre if you know anything about werewolf and furries as it turns out, neither of them did. Both writers built their plots with common elements from the booming fan-generated body of literature called the Omegaverse. I'm assuming that it's like a very specific type of werewolf universe because none of those alpha, omega, marking wolves belongs to anybody specifically. Like you could have that in so many other things outside of an Omegaverse because it's just animalistic. The dispute between the dispute between Miss Kane and Miss Ellis is a kink-laden microchasm of tactics at play throughout the fanfic industry as the genre commercializes authors aggressively defend their livelihoods sometimes using the 1998 law the Digital Millennium Act, Copyright Act to get online retailers to remove competitors books smarmy move let's just take down other people writing the same thing as me so people don't have a choice and they have to choose me garbage you're a garbage person if you do this when making a claim, a creator must have a good faith belief yeah, that the, her ownership of the work in question has been infringed. But does that mean when the ultimate source material, what does that mean when the ultimate source material is a crowdsourced collective? The question has members of the Omegaverse community choosing sides between Miss Kane and Miss Ellis, as will a federal judge in Virginia who is considering whether the allegations and consequences merit a payout of more than a million dollars. Short answer, it doesn't. I hope the judge does not rule in Miss Kane's side because she does not own any of the things she's claiming she owns. This is not the only time this sort of thing has happened, though, as there have been battles over ownership within the SCP uh, collective crowdsource thing. SCP is more of a horror thing with little monsters, big monsters, too, all sorts of monsters, and creatures, weird things, artifacts, self-inserts now because it's gotten so big that people are self-inserting themselves into the situations. Um of dangerous or mundane creatures that are just outside of the norm and they have been captured in a lab and they're held in a lab for safety, blah, blah, blah. And people trying to claim ownership of that when it's a crowdsourced collective thing. New York Times writes, welcome to the Omegaverse where men can get pregnant. To untangle, oh yeah, it's weird. It's weird stuff when you really get into the deep romantic side of, uh, fanfic side of the internet. 
To untangle the Omegaverse fight, it helps to understand its origins in a parallel literary universe, the vastly unruly, diverse, exuberant, and often pornographic world of fanfiction. After getting its start decades ago in Star Trek zines, fanfic mushroomed when the internet made it easy for especially dedicated consumers of pop culture to find and create stories for one another. There are now subgenres upon subgenres, from Slash, where two male characters pair up romantically, such as Sherlock Holmes and Watson, to otter fare like mundane AU, an alternative universe where magical characters live in real world, e.g. Harry Potter goes to a regular boarding school and has normal problems. There's a very famous Harry Potter fan fiction called My Immortal. It's terrible. It's famous for how terrible it is. While some traditional authors have derided fanfiction writers as creative parasites, there isn't really any way to stop them. Such works are legal as long as writers post them for free and don't try to sell stories based on copyrighted material, which is what makes a lot of these people even more smarmy, is they know what they're doing is illegal, and they change it just slightly enough to make it not illegal. But I I would agree, not so not all fanfiction writers are parasites in my opinion because i consider stuff like you know the silent hill movies the muppet movies that are more recent anything that is in an established universe but not by the original creator is a form of fan fiction so even if uh an author is alive let's say the hbo um game of thrones because the writer is still alive but he didn't necessarily write the television show so the television show is fan fiction of the book because it's not by the original author. And so when it diverts from what the original author did, it's not so bad because you're like, well, this is somebody else's take on what they wanted to see happen anyway. Uh, I didn't watch the show. I don't care. But that's fan fiction for me. So not everything that's fan fiction is bad. However, when you've got these people that write specifically, especially um, erotic stuff and romance stuff using your name, your recognizable characters, your universe in order to bleed fans off of you to them for their work, that is parasitic. When they create a fan base from your name recognition and your character recognition and then boost that into sales for them, that is parasitic. And that is smarmy. It's legal, it's smarmy, and you're a bad person for doing it. But too much money was at stake for the genre to remain amateur forever. E.L. James' blockbuster series, Fifty Shades of Grey, which sold more than 150 million copies, started as a fanfic based on Stephanie Meyer's Twilight Vampire Saga. I would say inspired by, because there's really nothing in common between the two. But again, it's just thirsty women writing scenes. And it's, it's even weirder, I think, for stuff like Fifty Shades, which was inspired by a story about teenager, a teenager, and it was entirely sexual. So there's that. Uh, by swapping out copyrighted characters for nominally original ones, a practice known as filing off the serial numbers, which people should take that as being, this is kind of illegal, uh, fanfic writers like Miss James, Christina Lauren, and the cheekily named T Tara Sumi have leapfrogged, from, uh, leapfrogged into for-profit publishing. So uh, that should also let you know that you're a smarm. That is your cohort right there. As more fanfiction writers cross into commercial publishing, turf wars have erupted. Fanfiction made authors and publishers realize that there was a thriving market for the stuff, said Rebecca Tershnit, a copyright expert at Harvard Law School. There's much more of it, and there's more opportunities for conflict. The specific fanfic universe that spawned the Kane ellis dispute emerged about a decade ago when devotees of the CW drama Supernatural began writing stories in which the two lead actors are lovers. They're brothers in the show, mind you. One would be the dominant alpha male, the other man would be feminized omega, often with the ability to become impregnated, a trope known as impreg. It's a lot more widespread than you might think. Canine and then lupine, sex stuff, got mixed in. It's all just super horny, thirsty women who are either single or married to a soy boy. The premise was wildly popular, and tropes were rapidly adopted by writers and other fandoms, including NBC's Hannibal, we're sexualizing Hannibal here, you guys. <laughs> I'm just imagining somebody being so obsessed with Hannibal now that they make him pregnant, but he was probably the one raping somebody and making them pregnant, to be honest with you. And MTV's Teen Wolf. The sprawling body of work that followed came to be known as the Omegaverse with its own rules, plot elements, and terminology. It sounds just like a genre, honestly. Some Omegaverses, some Omegaverse stories involve lyco lycanthropes. I always, it's okay. It's okay. I got it. Lycanthropes. Which are werewolves. Vampires, shapeshifters, dragons, space pirates, other features, others feature regular humans. 
but virtually all Omegaverse couples engage in wolf-like behaviors. Alphas rut and omegas go through heat cycles releasing pheromones that drive alphas into lusty frenzies this is obviously inspired by uh the very popular female fantasy of rough sex and rape where they want the sex but they don't want to want the sex for purity reasons or they want the rough sex rape is one of the highest in female fantasies mind you according to psychological studies one particular physiological quirk that ubiqui- that's lu- ubiquitous to Omegaverse stories called nodding comes from real features of wolf's penises, which swell during intercourse, causing the mating pair to remain physically bound to increase the chance of insemination. And yet here we have Miss Kane saying that she claims that as something that is hers that other people are copying and stealing from her. A biological fact, you guys. Biological reality is being claimed as ownable by one person who first published her knockoff story in 2016. Yes, I'm going to be mean. She's suing people and taking down other stories for unoriginal ideas, she's claiming. The appetite for such tales is large and growing. In the past decade, more than 70,000 stories set in the Omegaverse have been published on the fanfiction site Archive of Your Own. That's what it is. As it became more popular, the Omegaverse transcended individual fandoms and became an established genre on its own. Writers began publishing Omegaverse stories with original characters and settings, and authors started to publish them for profit. On Amazon, there are hundreds of novels for sale, including titles like Pregnant Rockstar Omega, Wolf Spirit, A Reverse Harem Omegaverse Romance, and Some Bunny to Love, an M.M. Imprig Shifter Romance, an improbable tale involving an alpha male who can trans form into a rabbit i know horny women are insane like you get the cat ladies or you get these ladies or you get like a combination of cat ladies and insanely horny want to get knotted ladies This was a thriving commercial backdrop to Mrs. Kane's allegations that Miss Ellis stole her material. Miss Ellis thought that the claim was absurd and was prepared to say so in court. This is like me saying, okay, I would, I'm going to write a story about a princess in a tower being saved by a prince, and then they go and get happily ever after married. Okay, now that I've written that story, I'm going to claim that trope as my own. I came up with that. It is mine. And any story that exists in the universe that has the story of boy meets girl in tower, or desperate situation and then they live happily ever after that is mine anybody that copies it is infringing on my rights and steal stole my story and i can take them down legally do you see how insane that is she uh, proved to me that you were the first person ever to come up with anything that you have posted miss kane as what was stolen from you oh that's right you can't the cat mama strikes didn't i just make a joke about how the how cat moms are like that like cat women One day last spring, Miss Ellis met me for coffee at a hotel near Paddington Station. She doesn't seem like someone who writes dark, edgy, sometimes violent erotica. She's young, cheerful, and works in education in London, which is one of the reasons she declined to publish her name under her real name, probably also to avoid the hate uh, of Miss Kane's mob. Most days, she gets up at four in the morning. Yeah, four in the morning to write, then heads to school where she works. On her Amazon author page, she describes herself as a cat mama who loves sexual tension that jumps off the page. Miss Ellis said that she got into fan fiction in 2006. She read stories set in the Harry Potter universe at first, and then moved on to other fandoms, including the BBC's Sherlock, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, that introduced her to the Omega verse. The genre was unlike anything else she'd encountered. She began dabbling in her own original writing in the late 2017. Began working on Myth of Omega. So she was in a fan fiction well before Kane was even in the fan fiction. Set in the medieval fantasy world, the first novel Crave to Conquer features an alpha emperor who becomes obsessed with a beguiling undercover Omega spy named Kaelin. She resists his advances using magic to mask the scent of her pheromones until she is overcome by the logical biological imperative. To appeal to other Omegaverse and dark fantasy romance fans, Miss Ellis built the narrative around standard genre elements, the wolf-like ticks of mating are in mating and an edgy a dominant submissive dynamic in fan fiction terminology some of the sexual scenarios are labeled dubcon or dubious consent yeah there's a lot of that there's it, it blows my mind so often how many people get really really mad at like rape or not not necessarily straightforward consent in in mainstream stuff like not stopping to go hey are you okay with this okay yeah then let's go there's so much 
rage on Twitter and on regular social media about mainstream stuff that they think is crossing the line into rape. But it completely ignores dubious consent and completely non-consent uh, fan fiction and stories that are all over the place. So much Japanese content is straight up non-con. You have to make sure to use the tropes of the Omegaverse in order to be considered by fans of the genre, which is pretty typical of every genre. Ask anybody who writes in romance, you have to appeal to the romance tropes or else... No. <laughs> it's not romance. Miss Ellis said, Crave to Conquer and its sequel, Crave to Capture, were published in early 2018 by Quill Inc. Books, a London company she founded. Readers gave the series glowing reviews on Goodreads and Amazon, calling it sensational new Omegaverse and the best Omega. Yet in late April 2018, Miss Ellis got an email from a reader who had ordered one of her books from Barnes & Noble, then learned that it wasn't available anymore. She soon discovered that all of her bo- Omegaverse books had disappeared from major stores, all because of a claim of copyright infringement from Kane and her publisher. Miss Ellis found it bewildering. Quote, I can't see how a story I had written using recognizable tropes from a shared universe to tell a story that was quite different from anything else out there commercially could be targeted in that way, Miss Ellis said. There are moments and scenarios that seem almost identical, but it's a trope that can be found in hundreds of stories. It's true. Like being attracted to pheromones, not unique, even even to the Omegaverse. It's not the only place that you're going to see somebody being pulled to a, to a, a pheromones. Uh, one of my favorite, one of the favorite powers that I discovered some years ago, just to toy with, and I've never used it in any of my writing, but it was pheromonal inclination, and it was being able to manipulate your pheromones in order to control somebody else. Uh, I talk about this in my book review discussion, whatever, of um, Perfume, where the whole thing behind his character drive is the pheromones and personal scent and he is drawn to all of these maidens because of their perfect pheromones that he then creates the perfect scent for himself from their pheromones it's not a unique idea and it's not a copyrightable idea it's biology it exists a lawyer for miss ellis miss ellis and quill quill sorry filled counter notices to websites that had removed her books she took some weeks to restore the titles some week Some took weeks to restore the titles, others took months. There was no way to recover the lost sales. As a new author, I was building momentum, and that momentum was lost, Miss Ellis said. And she worried that the plagiarist label would permanently mar her reputation. That's kind of one of the things that's wrong with doing, one of the extra things that's wrong with doing this, is you have to, one, so Kane knew that you do rapid release in order to build Uh, a base and show up in the sales right to build your brand so she stopped ellis from being able to do that she also got ellis's name if you look up if you if you google her she's going to show up next to plagiarist she's going to show up next to this dispute copyright claims her fight with what's her face claiming that she stole stories so she's going to be marred with that until she creates a new name and disassociates herself with the other name and still that could follow her so what Ellis, what Kane is basically doing to Ellis is trying to destroy her ability to write in this genre that Kane, Addison Kane, apparently wants to wear the crown in and choose who gets to write it and who doesn't get to write it because she's not throwing copyright claims against everyone. Just apparently this one and probably a couple other people. Who knows how many people she threw this at. Miss Ellis decided to sue. Everything would have been in question. My integrity would have been in question. My ability to write and tell stories. All of that would have been under threat if I didn't challenge these claims. In the fall of 2018, Quill Inc. filed against Blushing Books and Miss Kane in federal court in Oklahoma, where Miss Ellis' digital distributor is based, seeking $1.25 million in damages for defamation, interfering with Miss Ellis' career, and for filing false copyright infringement notices. In the suit, Quill's lawyers argue that, quote, no one owns the Omegaverse, or the various tropes that define Omegaverse, end quote. Miss Ellis's lawyers thought they had a strong position, but they struggled to find a prior case that addressed whether fan fiction tropes could be protected by copyright. Tropes cannot be protected by copyright. You cannot have somebody own the chosen one. You cannot have somebody own their parents got murdered. And so they're an orphan. You cannot have somebody own going on a quest. There is no way to own a trope. It's a type of storytelling. You cannot have somebody own love triangles. How insane is this? We are working at cases to see if the court, and they're not even, like, this is on based on fan fiction. Be suing guys that are using fan fiction. 
how do you think that you can copyright claim a trope but can't copyright claim fan fiction? <sighs> We're looking at cases to see if the courts had ever dealt with anything like this before, dealing with the emergence of this new literary genre, said Gideon Linescom, a lawyer who represents Quill Inc. and Miss Ellis. We found there weren't any. Well, there, sh there shouldn't be, again, any claim over a trope. Maliciously weaponizing the DMCA, the intense rivalry isn't limited to writers of the Omegaverse. As online publishers have gotten more competitive, there are millions of ebooks available on Amazon, up to 600,000 in 2014. Some genre authors have grown aggressive in their efforts to dominate their literary niche. So again, it's a bunch of greedy people trying to shut down others writing in their genre so that they can just corner it by legally trying to take other people down for telling stories. Focus on craft. Just tell a good story and you'll bring people back without having to try to shut up other people. You're a bad person. And I do not have a problem telling you. If you do this, you're a sick, nasty person. Get over yourself. Last year, an author who wrote a popular romance subgenre called Reverse Harem High School Bully Romance, a trope in which a teenage female character has several aggressive male suitors, claimed that another author had copied her book and demanded the removal of them. You know how many... The harem romance is itself a trope. The reverse harem is also a trope. Falling in love with enemies to lovers is also a trope. No. You're a bad person. The accused author briefly removed her works from Amazon but restored them after consulting a lawyer. <sighs> this is like the bigger problem with... I would say maybe the second biggest problem with self-publishing. First problem is you have all these people publishing stuff that have no business publishing anything because... They're not checking the storylines. They're not checking the writing, the grammar, the spelling, anything. They're just putting anything out there to try and make money and maybe to try to get famous and get a movie. The second thing is you've got all these amateur authors now who, one, don't know what is actually copyrightable and trademarkable, and two, trying to corner the markets by forcing others out by claiming they own something they don't own. It's so unprofessional. Other authors have tried to use trademarks to go after their rivals. It's... Writers have attempted to trademark generic phrases like Dragon Slayer and even the word dark. Yeah. Try taking down a bunch of people for using dark and Dragon Slayer in their respective genres. It's so sick. In 2018, the self-published romance author Felina Hopkins caused a scandal after she registered a trademark for the word cocky and sent infringement notices to other romance authors who used the word in their title. Amazon temporarily removed some books, including her cocky firefighters and her cocky doctors. After suing several people unsuccessfully, Miss Hopkins backed down. Let's also not forget that Ohio State University, the state of Ohio, I think it was the state of Ohio, tried to copyright the word the and said that was part of their brand, and they, so they deserve to own the word the. Just stop it, you greedy bastards. That's all you are. Like Cockygate, the Omegaverse case reveals how easily intellectual property law can be weaponized by authors seeking to take down their rivals. Under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, individuals or companies can send takedown notices to retailers as long as they have a good faith belief that their work has been infringed. Retailers are protected from being named in related litigations if they remove the materials and many websites comply with DMCAs without even investigating the claims. Legal experts say the system is easily abused. Well, no duh. This has been also been happening on YouTube for a while now. <sighs> We've seen lots of people sending DMCA notices when it's pretty obvious that they didn't think there was a copyright infringement, said Mitch Stoltz, a senior staff attorney for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit digital rights group. There's not much accountability, so there needs to be some kind of punishment for false DMCA claims, honestly. On May 21st, just like there needs to be uh, some punishment for false rape claims. On May 21st, the U.S. Copyright Office has released a report detailing how the 22-year-old DMCA has failed to keep pace with the NR, 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 anarchic, anarchic digital ecosystem. As online platforms have been overwhelmed by the crushing volume of takedown notices, between 1998 and 2010, Google received more than 3 million such notices. In 2017, the company got more than 880 million, an increase of more than 29,000%, according to the report. Stop. You people need to stop it. You're out of control and power hungry. You're disgusting. We need to bring back public shaming. 
Many requests are legitimate, but the report notes that other motives include anti-competitive purposes to harass a platform or consumer or to try and chill speech that the rights holder does not like. Amazon agrees that it's a problem. At the rise of self-publishing has produced a flood of digital content, authors frequently use copyright notices to squash their competition. During a public hearing hosted by the U.S. Copyright Office in 2016, Stephen Wirth, Amazon's associate general counsel, said that the fraudulent copyright complaints by authors accounted for more than half of the takedown notices the company receives. We need to fix the problem of notices that are used improperly to attack other works maliciously. In the Omegaverse case, Ms. Kane's claim of copyright infringement against Ms. Ellis has struck some as especially tenuous. Quote, they are not very original, either of them, said Christine Buse. I would actually say the same thing. You're just using tropes and playing on um, a popular thirsty genre. Just like, you know, average slash poor girl meets billionaire. It, it's a trope. I mean, it's not insanely. It, that's one of the things that makes it so easy to write and to sell. It's because people go in for something specific and they want something specific. You know how to give it to them. They pay for it again and again and again. It's not revolutionary, people. The author of Framing Fan Fiction, who has written academic essays about the Omegaverse and submitted expert witness testimony in the case of Miss, on Miss Ellis's behalf. They both stole from fandom or existing tropes in the wild. Thank you, Christina. Intellectual property experts say copyright protection applies to the expression of ideas through particular phrasing but doesn't cover literary tropes and standard plot points. Yeah, because you cannot copyright an idea. Like, that's what this falls into. For uh, Ellis's lawyers, if this is still in litigation, you cannot copyright ideas. Technically, see, so I went through this when I was looking up stuff for um, any issues I might run into with Dead End Drive because that was inspired by a board game from 1993, okay? Uh, and according to copyright, they can only copyright the art style and the rule book. I can make the game over completely. It can be exactly the same, except I have to bring my own art and my own literature. You cannot copyright an idea. That is why you have so many knockoffs of the same thing. Because somebody sees something successful, and they like that idea, so they take it for themselves. We see it in products. We see it in books. We see it in movies. We see it in everything. You cannot copyright an idea. A trope is an idea. Use that in your argument. The writers of a crime novel, for example, can't copyright the notion of a body discovered in the first act and a killer getting caught in the end. But the Omegaverse case is likely the first time these legal arguments have been invoked in a dispute over works that grew out of the corpus of fan fiction generated informally by thousands of writers. It doesn't matter. It's an idea. I don't see how, how it came to be or where it comes from affects the fact that you can't copyright an idea. <clears throat> In fact, and these tropes exist outside of fan fiction, so stop saying that it belongs to fan fiction. In fan fiction, the sharing of tropes and story parts and plot lines is free-flowing, said Anne Jameson, a fanfic expert and associate professor of English at the University of... I cannot believe that we have fan fiction experts, who is skeptical of the notion of that Omegaverse tropes could be copyrighted. They can't. I don't know how many times I have to say they can't. I'm just getting pissed off, and I know I'm repeating myself, but it's annoying as frick. There's a blurry line between what is specifically yours and what is somebody else's. Hello, characters are yours, ideas are not yours. I can see somebody write a good book and go, I love, freaking love that idea, I want to do it myself, and then see what happens. Can't do anything. Even if I blatantly rip off their idea, can't do anything. As long as I do it my own in my own words. Yep. I don't want her to make any more money. Miss Ellis wasn't the first Omegaverse figure Miss Kane accused of plagiarism. In March of 2016, she wrote a Facebook post charging that another author, who wrote under the name Dragon's Maiden, had copied at least 15 plot points from her novel Born to be Bred. Born to, yeah. In a message to Miss Kane, which Miss Kane posted on Facebook, the Dragon's Maiden denied that she had stolen anything and argued that there are some similarities, but honestly, I believe that they don't go beyond be uh, common lichen traits and actual wolf behaviors. But after being called a plagiarist in online comments, the Dragon Maiden, who lives in Wisconsin, removed her stories from the internet. Her fans came after me, even though our stories, other than being Omegaverse, were nothing alike. She said in an interview, again, you're creating a passionate mob that you can stoke up to attack people you don't like and scare them off the internet. Social media is such a disease, really. Two years later, Miss Kane and her publisher filed DMCA takedowns uh, requests against Miss Ellis's first two Myth of Omega 
books. Miss Kane also asked her publisher to file an infringement notice against Miss Ellis uh, or an Ellis novel that hadn't been published yet. You're garbage. Both th bo uh, book three needs to come down to. I don't want her to t make any more money off of this series. Miss Kane wrote to Blushing Books in April, according to the court file. She doesn't even know if anything in that book is plagi plagiarized because she hasn't read it. She's just attacking somebody up front. So that they don't have to, so they don't have a chance to get in the door of the the genre that she works in. Disgusting. She also wanted to stop Miss Ellis from publishing a new spinoff series of Omega's verse books and emailed her publisher asking what they could do. Bethany Burke, the publisher of Blushing Books, was skeptical. The problem is, as you say, you do not own Omega verse. I don't know what mechanisms we can use to shut down completely as an author unless you want to try to trademark Omegaverse, which we might be able to get. No, what the frick? You cannot, you cannot copyright a trope. That message produced in Discovery probably won't help Miss Kane's chances in court. Thank God. She has not always been her own best advocate. In the de uh, deposition last year, Miss Kane said that the overlap between her books and Miss Ellis's series went beyond the Omegaverse elements. Quote, it has nothing to do with tropes. It has nothing to do with Omegaverse. It has to do with plot similarities. Can't, again, I can copy somebody else's book as long as I do it in my own words. It doesn't matter. But when she was asked to cite specific examples, she said that she couldn't recall any, adding that she hadn't done a close comparison because it was too upsetting. Quote, it was hard for me to read them side by side, honestly, because I felt very violated, she said. This is an argument against women doing anything other than working in the kitchen, honestly. I, I can't point to any actual violations because my feelings, there are no violations. Still, Miss Kane is fighting the lawsuit. Quote, the theft of my work was devastating, she wrote on a Facebook message to her followers last spring. Unfortunately... I am now facing retaliation from doing what I am legally allowed to do, which is to try and prevent unauthorized uses of my work. You know, you're trying to claim somebody else's work a bunch of times over. More than 70 fans left encouraging notes punctuated by heart emojis and angry cat gifts. Of course. It is infuriating that she can drag you through this when she is the one who stole your work, one wrote. Miss Kane, who now lives in Virginia with her husband and two-year-old daughter, said through her lawyer over email that she disagrees with the claims brought against her but declined to discuss specific allegations, citing ongoing litigation. The biggest development in the case so far is that Blushing Books has left Miss Kane to contest the matter alone because she doesn't have a case and it's going to look bad on them. Last year, the publisher conceded that no plagiariz plagiarism or copyright infringement had occurred, and yet they sent cease and desist letters. Maybe you should investigate this before you send out letters. And a judgment was entered against the company, which paid undisclosed monetary damages to Quill and Miss Ellis. Yeah, maybe start start looking into stuff before you start jumping the gun like that. Miss Kane is now self-published because she's a pariah. Miss Ellis and her publishing company filed a new civil lawsuit against Miss Kane in her home state of Virginia, arguing that she maliciously directed her publisher to send false copyright infringement notices to retailers. Miss Kane's lawyer have denied the claims and have lined up authors, bloggers, and readers as witness. I will be a witness. To the fact that you cannot copyright ideas. Okay, bring me in. If you need somebody, I can talk about ideas. If the judge or a jury, and I will also, if this if this fails, I'm going to copyright the idea of judges and jury so I can sue every single person that holds a court case and doesn't pay me money. Because I came up with the ideas of uh, suing people. No copy. I'm looking at you right now. Do not copy my idea. No sue. I'm serious. If the judge or jury find Miss Kane in the wrong, the case would send a message to overzealous genre writers that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is not to be abused. By the same token, authors of genuinely original stories might find that they have w one fewer legal lever to protect their work. And a victory of Miss Kane could encourage a free for all, emboldening authors to knock back competitors and formally assert their ownership over swathes of fan fiction universe and common tropes in genre fiction. Not just fan fiction universe, but just Insta. If Go after the fan fiction first. If you can if you can copyright an idea, then what these people are doing by taking stuff from fan fiction should be an infringement before tropes ever are. Excuse me, this feels so backwards. Discovery is ongoing and a a pre-trial conference before a judge is scheduled in June. In the meantime, the Omegaverse continues to thrive. This year, more than 200 new books 
from the genre have been published on Amazon. Did she send a takedown to all of those? The latest batch draws on virtually every genre and trope imaginable. Par imaginable. Paranormal shifter romance, paranormal impreg romance, reverse harem romance, sci-fi alien warrior, warrior romance. There are fantastical alpha omega stories featuring witches, unicorns, dragons, vampires, werewolf shifters, bear shifters, and wolf shifters versus bear shifters. There are comparatively pedestrian omega verse romances about celebrity chefs, dentists, frat boys, bakers, bodyguards, and billionaires. In a teeming multiverse of stories, the tropes are still evolving inexhaustibly. Except I'm going to copyright all of them. So just be ready. Because all of y'all are already writing my stories for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll give you permission if you pay me. Don't worry. I'll make it affordable. But uh, this is terrible. This is smarmy. This is a bunch of low, greedy people taking down other people for writing things that they themselves are borrowing. And um, it needs to stop. We need to bring back public shaming. We need to ask people like this who are trying to claim ideas. She first published in 2016. Are you trying to tell me that there were no lycanthropy sex stories before her post in 2016 and then somehow she owns them because she did one? Please. Can we somehow get the furries in on this to say you don't own this stuff, please? It's just such a mess. Self-publishing has opened some doors but it's also opened a Pandora box of issues. I don't know Addison Kane personally. I feel like I recognize her name from the whole Courtney Milan debacle, but I can't remember at this moment, but I feel like she's got rabid people on Twitter. Don't quote me on that, though. I'd have to go look at the, the contents again. But it's a mess, and I hate this so much. It's so disgusting. It's so disingenuous. It's so greedy, and it's so disrespectful to the art and craft of storytelling. Just tell your stories and move on. If you're a good writer, you'll attract people. If you're a bad writer, you won't. Stop trying to take down other people for writing the same thing as you. But you know, I'm just one person. That's my opinion. I will be a character witness that you cannot copyright ideas and I will bring book after book and movie after movie of the same ideas again and again and again being used. It doesn't matter if it's in fan fiction. It doesn't matter if it's in original fiction. You cannot copyright an idea. You cannot copyright a trope. But let me know what you think in the comments down below. What is all this? And more importantly, more importantly, after hearing all of this, do you want to buy an Addison Cain book and support her career? Let me know. I want to hear from you. If you like this kind of content, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And until I see you again, don't die.